Hi, I'm Rachel Lancaster and this is the Magnificent Midlife Podcast. This is where we celebrate women in midlife and beyond. We challenge the status quo and bash those negative stereotypes about being an older woman. We're not over the hill at 40, 50, 60. We're just getting started. And the world needs us now more than ever. I'll be talking all things midlife, about issues that matter, and sharing fabulous stories of amazing women doing very cool stuff. Now's our time. My guest today is Jilly Smith. Jilly is an award-winning food writer, broadcaster, university lecturer, a retreat host, and most recently a podcaster. She's written lots of books and presents and produces a number of food-related podcasts, including the Right to Food podcast for the Food Foundation. Welcome, Jilly. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you. Me too. I'm very excited. I'd like to kick off with that latest podcast because it seems so timely with COVID and everything else that's going on. So right to food, what is it all about and how did it come about? Yeah, really interesting, actually, because it's almost a year since we started. So the Food Foundation, as you know, it fights for access for healthy food for every child in the UK. It's it's quite astonishing that four million children don't get access to healthy food. And are on the front line of food poverty. And of course, when lockdown happened, we were thinking about what we should do about that. So I was asked to go and make uh, a podcast for the Food Foundation about what it was like living in food poverty under lockdown. That was back in February, March last year. And it was really difficult because, of, first of all, I thought, you know, go back to the food ambassadors. We've got lots of young food ambassadors working at the Food Foundation. I thought they'd want to talk to me about it. But actually, the people who were living on uh, universal credit, actually, their situation hadn't changed too much at that time. You know, there was difficulty getting uh, food from the shelves. But what COVID revealed was all the other gaps in the system, the, in the food system overall. Um, I mean, just all sorts of examples, like the whole debate about climate change went out the window because people couldn't get enough to eat. And if you can't get enough to eat, you're not going to care about the planet. You're not going to make conscious food choices. You're not going to try and live your best life. You are absolutely scrabbling about to survive and to feed your children. So I started making programs about all the issues that were coming out around covid and the my favorite ones the ones i want everyone to listen to are the ones around food banks so the last three that i've made um i've just made two more now which we go which go out in the next couple of weeks and then i'm making four extraordinary ones after that which is basically taking the whole food system apart with young people and asking getting them to investigate whether we can really really change things so it's in a nutshell it's covid has absolutely blown the doors off everything that's wrong with the food system and i've been making podcasts about it um voiced by the food ambassadors themselves the kids who have lived experience of poverty supported by marcus rashford and emma thompson emma does the uh intros to the food bank ones um it's on the end child food poverty um marcus rashford website so it's the podcast for that i mean it it's just gone ballistic and it's a fantastic opportunity to really kind of listen to people and listen to the people who really need to be heard you know the, the extraordinary stories behind the food banks which started off as you know a, an amazing way of community support you know if the government can't sort this problem out the people will and the people came together and they sorted out the food banks. Well, actually, that turned into a really uplifting story. You know, it was no longer about poverty and, and desperation. It was about what happens when you walk through those food banks. What welcome do you receive? What, if you dig a little deeper, so I did one on BAME, BAME uh, Food Bank in Brighton. Look into that, you see the amazing outpouring of love around food you know syrian communities for example um so many different refugee communities whose identity is all about the food that they eat you know so that food bank gives them their culturally appropriate foods there's so many issues that we just weren't thinking about 
and it's it's a glorious listen it's some people have well all of the people I recorded have done so much to make people aware uh, of the whole food system it's amazing isn't it actually because I mean covid I don't know, we all hate COVID, but it is really changing up the world in so many ways. And this isn't a way that I had thought of until I read about what you were doing. You know, it hadn't occurred to me. And yet I thought it was just fascinating that A, this is happening, B, you're doing a podcast about it, and that you have become an agent for change in this area because of what you're doing. It just blows me away, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's. I was doing a mind map on New Year's Eve, as I do these days, rather than go out and get drunk. I do a mind map with my husband. <laughs> and, uh, and it's really interesting when you do those. It's kind of like, where does it all lead to? What do you want out of your next year? And impact was the word that came up. And I think that the Food Foundation certainly made me think about that, about what's possible. And so I've really ramped up my other podcast, Cooking the Books. So it's all about, I'm not holding back anymore. And this links very much with your kind of theme about midlife. I'm not going to let anyone stop me saying what I want to say. You know, I've been working behind the scenes on this for 30 years, and I've always felt a little bit uh, frightened, no, um, reticent let's just use a nice gentle word like reticent I didn't think it was my place to really be strong about saying yeah I this is what I think I'll interview plenty of people about what they think about sustainability and saving how to eat to save the planet which is kind of my big thing but I didn't feel that I could say it and now 2021 is about me saying it too so why didn't you feel it was your place to do that? It's very funny. I was talking to somebody just this morning who said the same thing. I, she didn't, you know, if she talks about, you know, a value being that she wants to make a difference, she, she thinks, well, who am I to think that I can make a difference in the world? And I was like, excuse me, who are you not to think that you can make a difference in the world? So why, what, what changed it apart from COVID? Well, it's not that I didn't think I could make a change. I mean, my whole life has been about making a change as a journalist. Um, I didn't feel that I could put nail my... Your colours to the my mast. My colours, that's one. My colours to the, <laughs> to the mast. As a journalist, you're supposed to be uh, impartial. And although I choose all the people who I interview, um, I choose the subjects for all the books that I propose and uh, have published, and... You know, it's all me. But my job has always been in television, in radio, in books, in magazines, in everything I've done. I'm the one holding the microphone. I'm, 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 I'm steering the debate, but I'm asking you for the answers. And I still do that. So, for example, there's one coming out next week with Sam Rice, who's uh, written a book called The Midlife Method. And her book with Mimi Spencer, The Midlife Kitchen, is one of my favourite books. It's really interesting about what happens to your body in midlife, but it's not a diet book. The Midlife Method is a diet book, but I wanted her on because Midlife Kitchen is one of my favourite books. But I also wanted to say that actually, although I don't like diets and I don't believe in diets and I think that they are a tyranny, um, I want to talk about conscious consumption. And I, I did the whole of that episode about diet being an opportunity if you are going to read something like the midlife method because you want to lose weight let's talk about how that makes you think three times a day about where you source your food from its impact on the planet the difference between high welfare meat and factory farmed meat going vegan as much as possible the 80 20 ratio all of those issues come out of even thinking about oh i've got a bit of a chub around my love handles do you know what i mean um, so I'm saying those things now and making the choices based on my agenda. And I haven't done that before. That's, it's really interesting hearing you say that because I, for me, that's the delight of the podcast medium and being an independent mm -hmm. producer of the podcast, because I've never had that issue. I, you know, my opinions are splattered all over this podcast you know and I don't hold back 
And um, that, for me, has, has been an absolute delight. So I've never had that restriction, but I can appreciate there was quite a, a move going from, yes, being the reporter who's got to not be the story, so to speak, to yeah. being more of the story yourself. Even that oh, makes could, you uncomfortable. Yes, really, because I'm not making myself the story. I I suppose what I'm doing... But your words, your thoughts... I your... don't think so. I think what I'm t- trying to do is get prod those ideas more deeply than I did before. And and choose... So I wouldn't, I wouldn't have put a diet book on. But actually, and I had the pinch of nom on the other day. Um, you know, they're the biggest publishing sensation, you know, the, the UK has ever seen. They smashed all records. Mm. And what I talked to them about was not how to lose weight and calories and stuff. I talked to them about how they've their constituency is very much based uh, of out of people who haven't been taught to cook, who can't feed their family, and they're the people who uh, a lot of them who um, I've worked with at the Food Foundation, you know, a whole generation, two generations in fact, who haven't learnt to cook at school, and so they can't feed their kids, and so they feed them junk food, and they become what heavy. And they become overweight, and that is uh, has implications on the health. And they die of COVID. And it goes on. So what the Pinch of Nom are doing is huge, absolutely huge. I mean, we all kind of burst into tears, you know, where we were talking about it. it the, the implication of what they do on millions of people, the fact that they can get that message to millions of people, mm. is unparalleled. It's so powerful. Yeah, if, if we can find our voice, that was going to be one of my questions later on as well, because I know that you're you're passionate about helping women to find their voice, aren't you? Um, I am, because I do, I teach podcasting as well. And uh, that's, again, something that, you know, a good thing from COVID has been the ability to, to do Zooms like this, you know. And, and it's, I was saying to my husband yesterday, I, you know, the, the connection. I guess, in these sessions with women, it's always women, it's so intimate and we can really drill down because I ask them why they want to make a podcast, not how. I don't teach them how to make a podcast, what do I do? We spend the, most of the first session really drilling down. Why do you want to make a podcast? What do you want to say? Why do you want to say that? Who to? How would that change your life? And it's like a, a, a therapy session. <laughs> yes. And and it's and it's phenomenally powerful, mm. you know. And it's it's always about being heard. Well, that's exactly why I started because I didn't feel that what I wanted to say was being heard enough. And I don't know whether there was perhaps a gap between my words on the page and somebody reading them. Whereas I think it's it's much more powerful when people hear the voice. When people hear you actually communicating, they can hear the passion in your voice or the upset in your voice or the emotion in your voice or whatever it is, but they can hear it. And that, I think, podcasting is is so powerful. And I love, as you say, I love the intimacy of it. Well, it's in your body. I mean, I've written a lot about this in, in the book that comes out in a couple of weeks, actually. It comes out in February how to start a pod, isn't it? How, oh, it's how to grow a pod is the podcast. How to grow a pod. And that's, oh, that's right. the podcast. Yeah. That's the podcast of the book, but it's called How to Start and Grow a Successful Podcast. But in it, I, I do talk about that immersive experience. You know, you are in someone's ears. You're in their body. It's mm. just you and your listener. Mm. Most times, anyway. I mean, my husband and I do love to binge on true crime um, podcasts <laughs> if we're on a long drive. But most of the time, it's on a dog walk or, you know, in the car on my own and with my headphones in. And, you know, something like George the Poet, you know, that is just the most extraordinary experience of... It is. That is amazing what he's yeah. done. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's totally immersive, isn't it? He's in the book. Is he? Yeah. And on the pod. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. I shall look forward to that. Wow. Um, talking about, you know, cooking the books, this is another podcast that you you have. And it is just wonderful. I mean, I love the way that you take, you talk to food writers, but you also talk to writers who write happen to write about food a lot. Uh, not necessarily that they are food writers and it's just wonderful and I 
particularly liked, uh, you weren't presenting it, unfortunately, but that Sarah Paretsky, you've, you've featured her, and I used to binge on V.I. Warshawski books. But did you? Yes. I haven't read one for years, but I read loads of them, and I loved them. And uh, and then to have her talking about food on the podcast. Well, was it was interesting because you know, I left the Delicious podcast in January last year and um, started cooking the books, my very first podcast of my own, in February. And at first I wanted it to be about food in fiction or memoir. I wanted to do any book, you know, a food, a food book, cookbook, philosophies whatever or fiction or memoir or any of those things and because I love reading and I just wanted to read more so I started with fiction and memoir and then novels and my friend um who's a bookseller EC reads on on book on Instagram she's amazing everybody should follow her at e.c.reads as in r-e-a-d-s and she curates the most amazing book list for you and um, <clears throat> so she loved Sarah Puretsky and she, she's absolutely a, the, a super fan. And so I, we had to do an interview over Zoom and I didn't like, I had never done any Zoom interviews by that time. And I said, no, I'm wrong. She was in London at a time that I couldn't do it, but I knew that Elizabeth was going to be in London at that time. And anyway, how could I interview Sarah Puretsky <laughs> when Elizabeth could do it? And she'd never done a podcast before. So I sent her off with my microphone and I told her how to do it. And I think she did a brilliant job considering she that she could too. barely wow. speak because <laughs> she was so, so gobsmacked by being in, in the same room <laughs> as her absolute heroine. So that was really funny. But it, actually, after a while, after Joanne Harris and, Shock, and um, The Strawberry Thief, I kind of thought, this isn't my world. My world is food writers and food. And that's what I've always been in. And it's so, I, I want to talk to people about that. I wanted to talk about how to eat to save the planet. And I was mm. ending up talking about, you know, chocolat to Joanna Harris. And <laughs> I love it. You know, I love Joanna Harris and I love chocolat and everything that goes with it. But I just wanted to talk about the stuff that was really important, actually. And so I went back to writing uh, to, to podcasting about food writers and that's when I really got into the sustainability thing in cooking the books much more and I realized that everyone I was talking to you know from Yotam Artelenghi to Gil Meller to you know Melissa Hensley they're all on the same story they're all on the same page and it's all about sustainability and they like talking about it because most people don't most people talk to them about what they'll do with a leg of lamb um, I don't. <laughs> yeah. I never do. <laughs> barely, barely even talk about recipes. Um, that's not what it's about. So, what are the key things and themes coming out about food sustainability that you would like to share? So, um, it's about being a conscious consumer. You know, it's about making your choices. It's about really understanding where food comes from and loving it, really loving it. Um, I was talking to, I don't think I can say his name yet. I was talking to somebody who's going to be on the next Celebrity MasterChef this morning. And he was oh. picking my brains about um, a very unlikely person to be on Celebrity MasterChef. And I know that he's a bit of a, he's quite conscious actually, even though he's a bit of a class clown, which is probably why they wanted him on there. And he was asking me if he should make this, that and the other thing. I was saying, first of all, you can't do that. I happen to know that's a really difficult recipe. And you, you just told me you can't cook. <laughs> you can chuck things into a slow cooker, but I don't think you're going to be able to do that. And I said, but I also know that you're really into organic food and you really care about what you put in your body and you really care about the planet. So here's your opportunity. And I managed to talk to him about, persuade him really to cook his first dish that will be purely local and it'll be about the story of that food um, and it all makes sense and that's what all my people who I talk to on Cooking the Books all have in common they really get the connection you know the whole feel to fork sounds such a sort of hackneyed phrase but it's about how important it is that 
you know, we have sheep on the on the hills to to munch down the grass, create this photosynthesis, bring the sunshine in so that it opens up the soil. We need the soil to survive. We've only got 60 harvests left. We're sitting on the most enormous climate emergency. Actually, we've got less than that because that was a, a UN figure uh, from 2015. So, you know, six, 54 years left. It doesn't have the same ring about it. I've not heard that before. Yeah, most people don't know. We are sitting I on the most that. enormous challenge to our food system and to our climate. And what each one of us can do is eat much, 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 much less meat and fish, stop overfishing the seas, eat sustainable fish, get it from a fishmonger, get your meat from a high welfare butcher if, if you eat meat at all. Farmers are the stewards of the land, so we must support them. The fishermen are the, the stewards of the sea. We must support them. Um, you know, compare that to going to the supermarket and just putting stuff in a trolley that you don't even look to see where it comes from. You know, it might come from, I don't know, Israel or Argentina, and you don't even know the carbon footprint. You don't even know the distribution system. You don't know about the issues of food justice. You don't know if those people have been paid properly to pick your cocoa beans that go in your chocolate you don't think about it and unwrapping all of that through talking about delicious food and amazing ways to to make food and the philosophies of all these people you know it's it makes when you've listened to them there it's a really engaging fun listen but that's what's going on behind every single conversation but it's it's really interesting and good that you're kind of you're wrapping it up, aren't you? You're doing a nice good PR job in that hopefully you're wheeling people in to listen to something and then you're doing your propaganda underneath yeah. about, you know, how to eat better for the planet and yeah. for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. I the the last book that I wrote, um, which came out in in September, Taste of the T V Chef, How Storytelling Can Save the Planet, tells the story of the T V chefs. First of all, I, I interviewed um, the producers when I was still working at the University of Brighton. It was my started off as my academic research. And I interviewed them all about the messaging, you know, how the producers of Two Fat Ladies and um, Nigella and Jamie Oliver and all those people um, taught Britain to cook because we weren't cooking before those people were on our televisions. And how we could actually change the way we eat again. And I remember one of the executives said, and she's making programs now in America about teenage pregnancies and she makes teen moms. And she said, yeah, it's about teenage pregnancy. And she says, but it's an entertaining piece of television. And she said, you just slip the message in while you're entertaining people. Yeah. Um, and you just keep doing it. And uh, that's, that's, that's the thing. That's the way to do it because you don't want to hector people. Um, people well, don't they want to just turn switch off. off. They don't. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I mean, most people, I think, I mean, I do preach to the converted a lot, I'm sure. But I think that what I do is I kind of, I mean, people like you, you're, you're probably a very conscious consumer, but you'll learn a lot from this conversation that you have just have put together. I've already learned. And then mm -hmm. you'll probably say it to somebody else and people listening to this podcast, they're probably, you know, conscious about lots of things in their lives, but they just hadn't joined the dots. And I think that's my job is to join the dots. It is about just raising the awareness of that we're always aware because yes I have this kind of big picture awareness but already you've got me to focus in on some specifics that you know next time I will I will apply those yeah and that's that's really important so do you think that Covid and or Brexit offer opportunities for better food management better food sustainability whatever i should whatever term i should use only in resistance um i think that any darkness offers an opportunity everything you know whenever something doesn't go right it gives you an opportunity to go okay let's have a rethink here what does this reveal what do we see is happening here so brexit for example um, how much are we relying on importing produce? Why can't we get our guys, our farmers, to produce more? 
you know, let's put some, let's put our love into our farming industry. They need us. And then they're the stewards of the land. Oh, hang on. They're the people who know all about land. Let's try and get them off the big pharma story and big pharma as in P-H-A-R-M-A rather than F-A-R. Um, and let's stop them giving all their subsidies to pesticides. And let's get an amazing farming economy. I mean, we've done it because of bird flu and, um, you know, all the food scares in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. That's where high welfare comes from. So that was an opportunity that came out of a disaster. We suddenly wanted our farms named um, because we wanted to know where our meat came from because there was horse meat on the um, on the aisles of little, no, where was it? I can't remember, Tesco. And and that caused people to think, ah, hang on, I need to check what's in my basket. Mm. Um, so that was the first consciousness raising exercise. We can do plenty more of that. You know, if we're, if we're getting our, our goods stopped at um, at the market, uh, at the borders, let's look at where we want our markets to be. Mm. Fishermen, you know, having to, so much of their, their catch is dying because they're being held up. Well, let's have a think about that. What do we need to do to support our fishermen? Go and have a chat with your fishmonger. See what you can do. Go in there and ask for the most sustainable fish. You know, just get yourself more Will aware. the fishmonger know? Yeah, that's what, of course they do. Yeah, that's their job. They wow. want you to talk to them. Wow. Yeah, most people don't talk to them. But we need to rethink everything, don't we? Because we're too proud to pick the flipping strawberries. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I've always said, you know. It's like all this food even the food that we have and that we're growing here we don't have anybody to pick it now yeah and you know i used to pick strawberries as a kid i'm sure you did too um i did an interview when i was at delicious about um a vineyard um up the road in sussex from me and he gets the whole community and doesn't employ pickers from eastern europe because I asked him two years ago how Brexit was going to affect him. He said, actually, it doesn't. He says, every year for the picking, the whole community comes together, old and young. And they do, they've do they done it every year. And it's a lovely, lovely. community initiative. Mm -hmm. That sounds wonderful. But yeah. that's going to take a lot of work to replicate yeah. that. Really I mean, I would okay. prefer the Eastern Europeans to, to have work here because, so um, <laughs> you know. But, you know, I don't want Brexit. I'm fiercely anti-Brexit. But I'm not one of those people who'll sit around moping about what's happened. We, we have, have to, to look make the at, best of it now. We have to yeah. look at the best of it, yeah. So I know you've interviewed some serious heavy hitters in the food industry. So what are some of your favourite moments or interviewees from what you do? Gosh, so many. So many. Um, you know, sometimes with the biggest names, it's not... It's something else that's exciting about it. So, you know, I wrote a book about Nigella in 2005, but I didn't meet her then. I nearly did. And it, I was supposed to be meeting her on 7-7, would you believe? And I was getting on the train and my husband rang me. He said, don't take the train to London today. And I said, but I'm going off to meet Nigella. And he said, the Home Secretary is on the radio saying, don't go to London. Went, all right, all right. Uh, yeah, that's what happened on, to me on 7-7. And I finally interviewed her at her home um, a couple of years back for Delicious. And um, I was coming out of the loo with wet hands when I first met her. I literally bumped into her. She was <laughs> bouncing down the stairs and I was coming out of her lovely pink loo. And I went, oh, <laughs> you know. So, and that was fun. Um, and then there's the moment when you know someone is on the publicity promo machine and as nice as they are you're just another person who's having lunch with or whatever and I love Rick Stein and I've interviewed him a few times but he clearly I don't think he, I mean, he's too nice to say he didn't remember me from the first time although I did have him literally in my big faux fur coat in Padstow <laughs> on the harbour to as a windshield um and he, he was, didn't remember you he, 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 he said something oh, nice but I don't think he did but sitting opposite him talking to him about his the france book the last one 
and I loved that book. And I kept asking him questions which showed that I'd really read it. And and I'd been to a lot of those places that he was talking about, but I really knew it, loved it, and cooked up the dishes. And he suddenly, you know, a lot most people don't do this. And this is the sadness of journalism these days. They people don't do that. Probably ask him mm. what his favourite colour was. And he kind of got the fact that I really did know what I was talking about and was genuinely interested in it. And then there was a look where he kind of woke up. And that was nice. That was lovely. It's the moment where he's going, actually, you did I, me. this is this is different, you know. And yeah. then we started talking differently. And that was lovely. That was really nice. But, you know, to be honest, um, it's the people who you would, probably wouldn't have heard of so much. Uh, Carolyn Steele, who I interviewed just before Christmas. Her, uh, she's on Cookie the Books and she went out on New Year's Eve. She has written a book called Zootopia, which is her her vision of a food-shaped world. It is everything I believe in, and it puts together a lot of the stuff that I didn't know. And to interview her, she, she changed my mind about food back in 2008 with her book, Hungry City. And to get to talk to her in such depth uh, was just wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And what were the top lessons from her then? Oh, gosh. Um, again, slow down. Don't believe the um, the, indus- the food industry largely run narratives like time poor. We're also time poor. Buy some more stuff. Buy some, buy some packets. Buy a recipe box. Buy this. Buy that. We can't afford to feed our children because we're time poor. No, we're not time poor. Um, you know, th- th- diets, all that kind of stuff. Um she talks about Epicurus. Um, Epicurean has taken on a completely different meaning. Epicurus actually himself was a philosopher who believed in the really simple pleasures of drinking water after a hot walk, but really taking pleasure. So really slowing down and really seeing what's in front of you, where it comes from, enjoying all that it is and really appreciating stuff and who you're with. So not checking your phone while you're having breakfast. Um, You know, just stopping all that and recognising what's under your nose. She talks about the mundane. And the root of the the word mundane is cosmic. Mundus is world. It's not the most boring thing in the world. It's the most amazing thing in the world, the mundane. And it's right under our noses. I thought that was breathtaking. Yeah, I love that. Wow. Wow. And that's what lockdown has done, I think. It's really kind of made us slow down and recognise what is under our noses. Yeah. And apparently people are cooking more because of lockdown too, aren't they? Much more. So how do we get food out of packaging? So farmers markets. Farmers markets need to be less middle class, more like they are all over the world. Most people cook or buy their food from markets. You know, you go to Italy or France or anywhere, anywhere in the world apart from here. Mm. And you buy your vegetables from a market. It's not a middle class thing. It's where you get your food. (laughs) We need to change the idea that (laughs) food is somehow bourgeois. You know, I wrote in um, A Taste and TV Chef about Hungary. And Hungary, as you know, um, was subject to Soviet rule. Um, uh, It became totally socialist for 30 years from the 1950s through. And um, one of the things that the that came out, of, that was first imposed on them, was that food was bourgeois. To enjoy food, food was seen as bourgeois. So everybody had to eat the same boring food, which was meat and potatoes. And it ripped the soul out of Hungary. And I interviewed a producer for um, the book who told me that he became a TV producer and he copied Jamie Oliver's programs and his books and I've seen the books they're extraordinary um, he found a, a, a Jamie Oliver copycat chef and he, he made a program exactly like Jamie's bish bash bosh all that stuff and he brought food back to Hungary and it has had the most incredible response okay. it was like an outpouring of national was like a sigh a national sigh you know there it is that's that's what we love 
And now the food in Budapest. Oh my God, it's incredible. Wow. Yeah, I mean, not just Michelin star. They do have a Michelin star restaurant. But the just just the general food, it's incredible. And it's full of story and identity and all that stuff that I love so much and put in, into cooking the books. So that's the other thing I love about interviewing people. The, the people who have a connection, a real connection with the food that they were, that was torn away from them in, in some way. So they might have come from a land where food was very much about their identity. Um, then they came to university here. Classically, that's seems to be the trope and they lose connection with the food from their land and they go they ring their parent parents or their grandmothers or whatever and they start to cook so olia hercules in the ukraine um oh man there's so many ravinda bogle um from africa she's an indian in africa i mean just amazing amazing food and identity issues it's so important that was one of the things i was gonna i was gonna ask you about actually was that because you you touch on so many different cuisines from around the world in your podcast um, and you sort of travel the world with these and I wanted to ask what are some of your favourite cuisines or from what culture that you like to either eat most or talk about most? That's so hard. Um, So there's two things that I would always go to. Um, I grew up in Malaysia or rather, I spent my first three years in Malaysia. My father was in the army, so we, we were in Malaysia, Malaya, in those days. And my parents were unusually really interested in food. And they used to go to eat at this particular little cafe, which by night was strewn with fairy lights and um, tables were outside um, and laid for the army people or any of the expats. And by day, it was the workers' canteen. But the food was always the same. And my parents used to go there a lot. And just before they left, they asked the chef. I mean, he was the cook, you know. Uh, it was just a place under a tree. And um, for the recipe of this particular curry. And they took it. We went to Germany next. And they kept playing with it and playing with it and playing with it. And they did it all their lives. So I was brought up on this particular curry. I mean, they cooked lots and lots of Mado Jaffrey curries and blah, blah, blah. They experimented with everything. But they always came back to this one curry. And passed it down. Both my parents died uh, about 10 years ago. And the last thing that my father ever tasted on the tip of his tongue was my daughter's version. She was then 14, version of the family curry. And he said it was perfect. So my go-to is that curry. So it's a Malay curry. Um, So that's my own personal one. But... Then I always think that the food of the Middle East is my probably my favourite in terms because it's so beautiful. It's, you know, the difference between Persian food and Israeli food and Arabic food, Palestinian take on on it. You know, they're all very similar, very, very similar. And, you know, it's heartbreaking to think that there's so much war in that territory, yet they all eat the same food. Hummus, for example. Yeah. You know, it's, it's crazy. But the stories of the food always bring it to life for me. And I love to hear the stories of food and identity. And I think there's just so many stories that I hear from the Middle East. Wow, that's lovely. I, Middle Eastern food is not something I know particularly well, actually. So I really ought to explore it some more. I know... I'm a big fan of Turkish food, yeah. um, but I don't I don't go much further east in terms of Middle East. Okay, Lebanese. Than, than, uh, so you probably do actually. Um, you you know hummus. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, so, I eat hummus till it comes out my ears. Well, there you go, exactly. <laughs> and I um, add chili sauce to it. <laughs> really spice it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, um, I've just been playing around with Sabrina Gyor's latest book, um, Simply which is basically sort of, you know, she's Iranian, so Persian. Um, She's the queen of Persian food. And that's just so beautiful. I mean, I had a cannellini bean mash the other day, which is so simple. Basically, it's a hummus, but you just warm it. can of cannellini beans, which is, what, 50p or something. You know, a bit of garlic, olive oil, heat it very, very gently, and I put some dill with it, mash it with a masher, Oh my god, it's still in my fridge, getting better every day. It's a 
Amazing. Wow. I do like the things that other cultures do with vegetables because we, I think the British, we just do not know how to cook vegetables. <laughs> I, grew, I grew up, sorry mum, I grew up on soggy veg <laughs> and, and I really try not to create soggy veg because that, that was what my dad liked. So that was what we had. And my dad didn't like pasta, so I don't think I had pasta until I left home, you know. Yeah. Um, the funny things that we have, but the British, we're not good with veg, are we? But other cultures are so good with vegetables. Well, I think we are now. I mean, a lot of the, the young chefs who I was, particularly when I was um, at Delicious, they have to have written a book to be on Cooking the Books. So a lot of these young chefs haven't yet written their books. They all wanted to be chefs because they watched Jamie, Jamie Oliver while they were growing up, you see. And they said, tell me that. And they travel a lot or they travel a lot in their gap year. They're exposed to a lot of, if they come from cities, they're probably exposed to a lot of diversity. They're naturally interested. So they're picking up these extraordinary ideas and doing incredible things with them. You know, the British food culture, it's not even one thing. It's it's an amalgam, a whole melting pot of all these wonderful different flavours and mm. influences from literally all over the world. I mean, we do live in an extraordinary country now. Um, oh, yeah. And the young guys are, are really running with it. I like to say where I live in North London, literally within, well, under normal circumstances, not COVID lockdown, but within five minutes of my front door, I can probably taste 20 different cuisines. There you go. It's Wonderful. remarkable, and yeah. that's one reason why I think I'll never leave here yeah. because I'd never get that anywhere else, yeah. unless Literally. it was Hong Kong or New York, maybe, which, no, both true. of which I've been to, you know. Yeah. But I just love that the yeah. diversity. Yeah. So, what would you like listeners to know in terms of food and what you've learned, and what message would you like to impart to them to really take on board that it's much easier and cheaper to eat with conscience than anybody thinks you know it's really inexpensive to cook the 80 20 so 80 vegetables 20 fish or meat ratio that is recommended to save the planet so simple there are hundreds of cookbooks out there and they're all online anyway so go to your local market. I go down to the open market. You know, I mean, I buy enough fruit and vegetables for the week. I do get the Riverford organic box for 14 quid once a week. Um, and I top it up with fruit and veg from the uh, open market, which costs very little. And I will go down there and I will find a recipe for the best looking thing. So it might be a celeriac or beetroot or whatever. And then I will just Google it generally. Um, I've got hundreds of cooks books or remember it. So a beetroot, I might remember the midlife kitchen did a really good one with a tamarind glaze. And then I'll think, oh, that, that will look so pretty on the plate. What do I want to eat with that? Actually very little. I might do some, you know, amazing squash because the color of the squash would go so beautifully with the beetroot for, a, you know, winter plate. So I'll, I'll think that way. And that will cost me nothing. I mean, I've got to have some tamarind glaze or tamarind in, in, in my fridge. But once you've got that in the pantry, you know, I've had it for about 10 years in my pantry. It doesn't go off. <laughs> you know, you, you, you put the things that you need in the pantry and then just play with things. It's much more fun. Doesn't take any time. Somebody left a, a, I can't even remember the name of it, one of those ingredient packets, you know, where you get a recipe and a whole load of packet, uh, a recipe and ingredients in a, in a box or something. And it was delivered to my house by mistake. And I, I could, you know, I couldn't send it back. So I cooked from it. It took me forever to work out what was going on here. There was a blooming plastic bag of chopped onions in it. Really? I mean, I could not believe it. Everything was in a plastic bag. Opening all these things, putting them together, I suddenly realised what they were trying to do with it. I could have done it in half the time. So, yeah, my message is learn to cook, teach yourself to cook. There's so many ways of doing it. Just follow a recipe. 
go to your market, find something that really takes your fancy, especially if you don't know what to do with it. Google it and then treat yourself. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Magnificent Midlife Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, share it and leave me a review wherever you're listening. It really helps me get the message out. You can find out more information about this episode in the show notes at magnificentmidlife.com. That's also where you'll find strategies, support and resources to help make your midlife magnificent. Get clarity on how to make the most of your next chapter. Help me change the world. One magnificent midlife woman at a time.